Hello and welcome. This is Congruent Coup, a project about past the coup and me, Seal the Human, as we explore leftist thinking, deconstruct the myths of capitalism, and talk about social justice as well as other important topics, and maybe even provide guidance for those looking for somewhere that aligns with their thoughts that can be difficult to articulate. We're here to learn as much as you are. Today's topic is the history of Palestine and why it doesn't really matter. Like, really. It does not matter in relation to how Israel is acting today. The history is used as a justification by an apartheid state of oppression and genocide, and therefore it's to be taken as just that, an excuse to displace and murder Palestinian people. That said, understanding the history of the region gives us insight into the Zionist movement and why we have an Israel at all. Let's take it back all the way to the Bronze Age, to the land of Canaan and southern Levant, an area surrounded by the Egyptian, Assyrian, Mitanni, and Hittite empires. The area had lots of importance. In modern times, we know this area by different countries of Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, some of Jordan, and some of Syria. Back in the Bronze Age, this was Canaan, where Canaanites roamed and thrived, where they built a vast and successful empire. It was all peachy, until near the end of the Bronze Age, Canaan fell, and from this once successful society was the rise of others. As the Bronze Age came to an end, the Iron Age began. In the 12th century BCE was the rise of Israel and Judah of the Israelites and Philistine city-states. Israelites evolved from Canaanites with a group believing in the monotheistic religion of Yahweh. The kingdom of Israel had the capital of Samaria and was north of the kingdom of Judah with its capital, Jerusalem. Philistine had cities such as Gaza and Ashkelon, living on the south coast of what was once Canaan. Israel first appeared in written context circa 1209 BCE. As these societies grew in the region, they faced many hardships. This area was conquered by the Assyrians as they expanded their domain in the 10th century BCE to the late 7th century BCE. Philistine and Israel were taken as part of this military expansion by Assyria. In the early 6th century BCE, the now Babylonians, who had conquered the Assyrians, caused a wake of destruction as they successfully rampaged through the land of Judah, taking 25% of the population back as captives. While Jerusalem has shown signs of destruction to population, much of Judah, however, was untouched by the invading Babylonians as their capital was the goal. Another change of hands occurred as Babylon fell in October 539 BCE. Enter the Persians. However, the Persians couldn't stay the rulers for all but a couple hundred years as they were toppled by the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Alexander the Great. He divided the Persian Empire, and this gave birth to the Seleucid Empire and the Hasmonean Dynasty. The Hasmonean Dynasty was semi-autonomous from the Seleucid Empire and controlled the lands of the Southern Levant. It was under this rule that Jew slowly replaced the term Judahite and Samaritan slowly replaced Israelite, peoples found in the regions of Judea and Samaria. When the Romans took control in the year 6 CE, not everyone was pleased by the change. This led to three Jewish-Roman wars, or rather, large-scale revolts, between 66 and 135 CE. In the First War, Jerusalem fell to the Romans after a long and brutal siege. In the Second War, Jewish rebels slaughtered Roman citizens of Cyrene and Cyprus, but eventually this rebel force was crushed by the Roman Empire. In the Third War, Israel was established as an independent state over parts of Judea until the Jews were eventually defeated by the Romans and barred from Jerusalem. 
They dispersed over the Roman Empire and abroad, leaving their homeland behind. Furthermore, the emperor Hadrian of Rome sought to completely eliminate Judaism in his reign. He attempted to erase the memory of Judea and replaced the name as Syria, Palestina. These wars took the Jewish population of the Mediterranean from being an established major population to a scattered people, a persecuted minority in the lands they were once in rule of. The Romans established themselves as a place of Christianity, and Palestine became a center for it. Of course, this only lasted until the 7th century, when it was conquered by Muslim empires. By the end of those Muslim conquests, Syria, Palestine, and Jordan had been taken. This has been coined the Muslim Conquest of the Levant. From this time forward, Palestine was taken by many different rulers. The Crusaders played a part, as this was a holy land for them. The Mongols had control for a while in the 13th century, but Palestine was about to experience some peace. Finally, the Ottoman Empire absorbed Palestine in 1516. Now we can approach recent history. Muslims, Jews, and Christians were allowed to exercise jurisdiction over their own members in Palestine under Ottoman rule. There were centuries of relative peace between the religious peoples of Palestine, each experiencing a large degree of autonomy. The population of Jerusalem was composed of members of about equal parts of the three religions, living peacefully in the same city with respect to each other. Of course, elsewhere in the world was an idea created called Zionism. Now, there were Zionist movements as far back as the 16th century, but the Haskalah movement of the late 18th century urged Jews to assimilate into Western culture. The early proponents thought that if there were a form of Jewish education and living, that they could fit in with the mainstream European culture. See, the Jews had largely lived in various settlements and ghettos, an evolution of centuries of segregation and discriminatory legislation. Zionism, however, stayed alive through anti-Semitism and Christian millennialism. Even into the 21st century, Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has proclaimed that evangelical Christians are best friends of Israel, promoting Zionism. Netanyahu says, and I quote, When I say we have no greater friends than Christian supporters of Israel, I know you've always stood with us. You stand with us because you stand with yourselves because we represent that common heritage of freedom that goes back thousands of years. Theodore Herzl was the leader of the modern Zionist movement, though initially he didn't care where the settlement became to exist, only that it would exist. However, this desire later changed in 1897. At the first Zionist Congress, he stated, Zionism strives to create for the Jewish people a home in Palestine, secured by public law. Even after that statement, he still didn't fully commit to it, though. Herzl and the Zionist Congress were offered 5,000 square miles in Uganda by the British government as a place for them to take as their own. Of course, without the native land dwellers' permission, because the British. After Herzl died in 1904, the Congress decided to decline the British offer. This was the shift that put Palestinian land into focus, as that's where their ancestors had lived and ruled. Zionism as a complete concept still didn't take off until the Russian Revolution of 1905, which caused a large population to emigrate to Palestine as pioneer settlers, a means to escape Russia at that time. By 1914, there were almost a 100,000 Jewish settlers living in Palestine. Things get complicated with the First World War, of course. Britain promised a division of lands with France 
of Turkish-held Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Palestine during a secret meeting in World War I. Britain also promised lands to Palestinian Arabs in a series of letters between the British High Commissioner in Egypt and the Emir of Mecca. Lastly, with the Balfour Declaration, the British had stated that they were in favor of Palestine being established as a national home for Jewish people. Before the war had even come to a conclusion, Britain had promised the Palestinian lands to three different groups of people. Good job, Britain. Every time they crop up in history, we know there's going to be some sound and level-headed decision-making for the betterment of all humanity. God save the Queen. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Arthur James Balfour World War I saw the conclusion of the Ottoman Empire as it fell and was divided. Peace in Palestinian lands would not exist again. The League of Nations put out a mandate for Britain to be the administration in Palestine while the state organized itself and prepared for self-determination. This mandate lasted from 1920 to 1948, and under British administration, Palestine had a surge of nationalism by both Israelis and Palestinians. Factors elsewhere, including anti-Semitism, contributed to rising tensions. As Germany turned ultra-nationalist and rallied behind Hitler, the Nazi party took over. Among general anti-Semitism on the rise in Europe, Nazi Germany had a particularly bad take on things. However, on the 25th of August, 1933, the Havara Agreement was finalized between Nazi authorities and Zionist Jews. The Jewish people, wishing to leave Germany, could sell all of their belongings and emigrate from Germany to Palestine where they would stay. Over the next six years under this agreement, about 60,000 German Jews landed in Palestine. In 1936, the Palestinian Arabs revolted against the British rule with the desire of independence. The response? The White Paper of 1939, which set the mandate to end in 10 years and be passed on to the United Nations. Britain had said the intention of theirs was to give independence to Palestine. This paper also caused tensions to flare with Zionists as it placed restrictions on Jewish immigration and land purchasing at a time when Jewish populations around the world were being discriminated against. World War II was the thing that followed, a really bad, awful thing that shouldn't really be overlooked. Many Jews fled to Palestine as refugees, oftentimes smuggled illegally because of the British fielded white paper. Holocaust survivors from Poland, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, survivors from all over Europe followed the Zionist trail to Palestine. The Palestinian problem was passed from Britain to a newly created United Nations in 1947. After deliberations on the topic, the UN set in place a plan to establish an independent Jewish state, an independent Arab state, and the city of Jerusalem. Immigration regulations of Jews into Palestine were to be lifted to ease post-World War II migration. While this was celebrated by the Jews living in Palestine, the Arabs were outraged, as what they were promised of the Palestine state was not to come to fruition. This UN plan caused civil war in Palestine. The Jordan army was controlled by the British, who supported this plan and gave aid 
to the Jews. Efforts by Golda Meir and others helped raise massive funds for the Jewish army from abroad, but especially from American sympathizers. These factors led to the Zionist army being able to annex land from Palestinian Arabs and end the civil war, causing over 250,000 Palestinian Arabs to flee the land. Thus, Israel was established as a state on the 14th of May, 1948. The Palestinian Arabs and surrounding countries rejected this proclamation, spurring an Arab-Israeli war the same year. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq entered Palestine in support. Israel had a strong military start established in the civil war in combination with poor coordination on the Arab front, which led to an Israeli victory. This victory left the Israel state with 80% of the territory that was offered to both parties in the UN plan earlier. Another 500,000 Palestinian Arabs fled Israel, leaving only 165,000 living there at that time. In 1956, tensions with Egypt rose to a point in which England, France, and Israel decided actions needed to be taken. See, Israel had struck an arms deal with Czechoslovakia. In response to this, Israel invaded Gaza and the Sinai, and then moved for the Suez Canal. Britain and France took the canal, but after the United States stepped in to stop hostilities against Egypt, a ceasefire began. Of course, this is only because they were scared that Soviet weapons and aid could be the better alternative to U.S. sources for Israel. Thanks, CIA. This caused England and France to step back from the region and the U.S. to begin its heavy influence of power. A decade later, in 1967, Israel fought in the Six-Day War. Border incidents near Syria, Egypt, and Jordan were increasing in frequency. As this was happening, Egypt blocked Israel off from access to the Red Sea. Egypt had also formed a pact with Jordan and Iraq, and the U.S. feared the rise of a superpower in the Middle East. Israel surprised Egypt by launching an air assault against their airfields, decimating the Egyptian air force before it even left the ground. A ceasefire was agreed upon. As a result, the U.S. support of Israel has been a factor in anti-Western sentiment to prevail through the region in Arab states. In 1973, Israel was again under attack. On October 6th, the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Israel was attacked by Egypt from the west and from Syria from the north. At a heavy cost, Israel again defended its land with military might. With aid from the U.S., Egypt and Israel signed a peace treaty at Camp David, and Egypt became the first Arab nation to do so. In 1970, Palestinians were expelled from Jordan, and there was a large number of migrants that made their way to Lebanon. The last of the Arab-Israeli wars was in 1982. Israel declared they wanted to push back Palestinian guerrilla fighters, and so they launched a full invasion into Lebanon. However, aside from pushing back fighters, Israel sought to instill a puppet regime in Beirut as a strategic point against Syria and other Arab nations. Israel took over West Beirut, and following this, almost 3,000 Palestinian civilians of men, women, and children were tortured to death by the Lebanese Falangist forces on Israel's behalf. In 1987, a Palestinian militant and national organization was founded with financial aid from Israel, called Hamas. Israel was hoping to destabilize the Gaza Strip and the West Bank from within. Hamas sought to liberate Palestine from Israel and have frequently said 
that they would accept a truce if Israel returned to the 1967 borders and paid reparations to the Palestinian people. Since their formation, however, Israel has used them as an excuse for their own attacks against Palestinians, not just Hamas, but for the destruction of civilian lives and infrastructure. Starting in the 70s, America has given substantial aid to Israel, mostly in the form of military aid to the tune of over a hundred billion dollars and counting. This has set them up as an extremely powerful military presence in the region and has given them vast military superiority over the Palestinians they defend against. As Joseph Biden said in 1982, and I quote, It's about time we stop apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interests in the region. America's unwavering support of Israel goes deep, and with that support, American taxes fund genocide. See, after reviewing all of the history of Palestine and the present region of Israel, it really doesn't matter. Jews have certainly had a harsh course on this earth. They have faced many injustices and mistreatments throughout most of history. Anti-Semitism has been around for thousands of years, and in the human history of the last 100, some of the darkest times have occurred at the expense of Jewish people. The thing about Israel, though, is that it's not about the Zionists of the 1800s. It's not about the Jewish population living in what was Palestine. It's not about the Holy Land. The issue with the current day ethnostate of Israel is that it's the existence of a far-right fascist state that oppresses, displaces, and murders Palestinians without consequence. The late Michael Brooks said about the Palestine and Israel issues, it's not a complex issue. It's super simple. There's one group with enormous power. It acts on another population of people with total impunity and is never held accountable for anything. There is no symmetry in the relationship, period. The history of Palestine has been used as justification for Israel's actions, but there is no justification that could ever suffice. They have acted upon Palestinians and enacted policies to dehumanize and slowly erode and destroy their population, carrying out incremental genocide. They have forcibly removed civilians from their homes. They have killed tens of thousands of civilians, of which many were children in strikes throughout the years. They have repeatedly shown that there is no value for Palestinian life to Israel. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has blatantly said regarding Palestinian people, beat them up, not once, but repeatedly. Beat them up so it hurts so badly, it's unbearable. Israel's former Defense Minister Moshe Yalon said in 2002, the Palestinian threat harbors cancer-like attributes that have to be severed. There are all kinds of solutions to cancer. Some say it's necessary to amputate organs, but at the moment, I am applying chemotherapy. Another former defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, said in 2015, those who are against us, there's nothing to be done. We need to pick up an ax and cut off his head. One more rather foul-tasting piece of cud to chew on. Former Israeli Minister of Culture and current Minister of Transport, Mary Regev, simply said, I am happy to be a fascist. Saying the quiet part out loud, huh? History doesn't provide justification, and Israel is trying to wipe out Palestine. So, what can be done about it? For a start, awareness. 
Western influence in the world has largely been pro-Israel and ignorant of the war crimes that it has committed, is committing. If we spread awareness about Palestine, just maybe we can begin to change the views on Israel in the West as a whole. We can fight against the propaganda with the truth of suffering and of the Palestinians who deserve better. If opinion of Israel is widely changed and they are held accountable for their actions without unwavering support from countries like the U.S., maybe they can move forward and find a solution. There's not a magic switch that can be flipped that will solve all of the problems for the Palestinians. But by spreading knowledge and information, we can hopefully help to allow for a positive change. That's this episode of Congruent Coup. Take care of yourselves, sea cuties. Have a wonderful day.